Hello scholars, welcome to IELTS listening test. The IELTS listening test is 40 minutes long. Audio would be not more than 30 minutes. You will have 10 minutes to transfer your answer. Good luck. The test is in four part. Part 1, part 2, part 3 and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a man telephoning a sports club to ask about membership and facilities. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Good morning. Oh, sorry. It's gone 12. I'll start again. Good afternoon, Kingswell Sports Club. How can I help you? Oh, good afternoon. I was wondering if you could give me some information about membership and facilities? Of course. What would you like to know? Do you have tennis courts, for example? No, I'm afraid we don't. We're primarily a golf club. What about football? I heard you had a team. No, I'm sorry. Perhaps you're thinking about Fresham Sports Centre. Oh, right. I know it. I've played badminton there. Have you? They've got a lot of facilities we don't have, and vice versa. We do have a Keep Fit studio, which is very popular with members, and then as well as that, there's swimming, of course. That's good. I like to swim every day. We have a range of classes, too. Do you have judo classes? I'm keen to learn. Well, at the moment, we offer kickboxing. We're planning to add judo and stretch classes soon. We're currently running a range of yoga classes, too. What about relaxing after exercise? I assume you have a restaurant or something? At the moment, we've got a salad bar, which is very popular. We'll also have a fully licensed restaurant by the end of the year. Sounds good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. What kind of membership are you interested in? Um, not really sure. Uh, what are the options? Well, there are three different membership schemes. I see. What's the difference? Well, the first one's called Gold, and you can use all the facilities at any time of the day or week. You can also join in as many classes as you like for free. That sounds good. Is it very expensive? Well, you pay a £250 joining fee, and then it's £450... Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's just gone up by £50. <laughs> sorry about that. It's now £500 for the annual subscription fee. Right, got that. And what's the next type? Well, that's silver. It's the same as gold, except you have to pay a small fee of one pound per lesson for any you do, and you can only use the centre at certain times. I see. So when exactly? You can only use the facilities between 10 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. So I couldn't use the pool at 8 in the morning or evening then? That's right. Okay. And the price for that? Is the joining fee the same as for gold? Actually, it's slightly less than the £250. It's £225, but the annual fee is only £300. Does that sound more like what you want? Well, it's still rather more expensive than I thought. I'm a student here in England, and I'm only here for six months. Ah, then the bronze scheme would probably suit you best. Uh, how is that different? Well, some of the facilities have restricted use. And do I have to pay for classes? Yes, it's £3 for each class you join. 
I see. And what are the hours then? Between ten thirty and three thirty weekdays only, and you pay a fifty pounds joining fee. The annual fee is a hundred and eighty pounds. It works out at fifteen pounds a month, so that would be quite a lot cheaper. Oh, that should be all right. I could come in my free periods. What do I have to do if I want to join? Well, we book you in for an assessment with an instructor, who will show you how to use all the equipment. If you want to organise a trial session and look around the centre, you'll need to speak to David Kinchley.、Mm, could you spell that, please? Yes, David, K Y N C H L E Y. I'll give you his direct line number. It's O four five eight nine five three double one. Thanks. Thank you for calling Kingswell Sports Club. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech by an official at a meeting of a local football club at the start of a new football season. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to the soccer club meeting. It's good to see so many parents and children here tonight, and I know you're looking forward to a great football season. Now, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some changes to the soccer club for the coming season. Now, this season. We'll be playing all our matches for both the junior and senior competitions at Kings Park instead of Royal Park, which was used last season. Now, for meetings, we're going to use the clubhouse in Kings Park, and the next meeting will be held in the clubhouse on the second of July. As usual, we hope to begin the season with a picnic next Saturday at the clubhouse. Please try and come to the picnic, as it's always good fun. At the last week of the season, we usually have a dinner and presentation of prizes to the players. And more information about this will be given to you later in the season. This season, we have more teams than ever. We hope to have ten teams instead of five in the junior competition, and they will play on Saturday mornings, beginning at 8:30 a.m. Training sessions will be held in Kings Park on Wednesday afternoons for the juniors. And they will be wearing red shirts again this year. In the senior competition, there will be four teams, same as last year, and their games will be played on Saturday afternoons, starting at two thirty. Oh no,、uh, sorry, it will be a, a two o'clock start, and the training session for seniors is planned for Sunday afternoons. Before you hear the rest of the speech. You have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. 
Now, I'd like to introduce you to the new committee for the soccer club for this season. Uh, firstly, let me welcome Robert Young, the new president, who will manage the meetings for the next two years. Robert's son has been playing football with the club for over five years now, and uh, many thanks to Robert for taking on the job of president. Next, we have Gina Costello. She's the treasurer, and she'll collect the fees from you for the season. Uh, please try and give Gina your fees as early as possible in the season, as the club needs the money to buy some new equipment. Then there's David West, who's volunteered to be the club secretary, and one of the many jobs he'll have is to send out newsletters to you regularly. If you have any information that may be useful, please let David know so that it can be included in these newsletters. Also, I'd like to introduce you to Jason Dokic, who is the head coach. For all the new members here tonight, this is the third year that Jason has been with us as head coach, and we're very lucky to have such an experienced coach and former player at our club. He will continue to supervise the teams at training sessions and on match days. Now, before we finish and have some uh, refreshments, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask the new committee? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Section three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing a business case study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. Hi. OK, so you're John and Sarah. I'm Neil. And you're having some problems with a project you're doing on the marketing module of the business studies course. Is that right? Yes, it's the one where we have to read the case studies of six businesses and assess their marketing and identify the main problems each one had. So what exactly is the problem? Well, we've been doing quite a lot of reading for it. Some of the readings we've looked at are quite difficult, but we still understand them, and they're interesting, so that's OK. It's taking a lot longer than we thought, though, so we're wondering if we can have an extension. We have a lot of other assignments, too. Well, extensions can be granted. However, it sounds like you're having issues with the planning of your time. Neither of you are sick or have had an accident, which are the only reasons that extensions are usually granted. The university's scheduling of deadline dates is organised so you can complete things on time. OK, we understand. We thought that would probably be the case. Well, let's see how you're doing with it. So you were given readings on six different companies. You needed to examine the main weaknesses of each company with regard to their marketing strategy. What did you find out about each company? Let's start with Stack Stationery. They were very experienced in marketing, as they have been in the stationery market for such a long time. Their profits have generally tended to increase continuously for many years. However, they had issues with their staff because they felt that too much money was being spent on marketing, but their wages did not increase for such a long time. Princeton Windows were quite successful initially as their marketing led to an increase in sales of 50%. However, this decreased again after a few months, so it just led to profits for a short time. They need to think about how they can sustain any increase in profits for longer periods. MK Cars focused on the wrong thing, because they didn't really understand who their target market was. Most of their buyers of cars are young people, but they advertised in newspapers that older people usually read. 
It would have been better to go for magazines popular with the younger generation. You must learn everything you can about who you are selling to. Lakeside Golf was probably the most successful of the six companies. They managed to generate a long-term increase in membership over a three-year period. The only real issue they had was that they weren't ready for the increase in numbers of people coming to play golf. So some people started to complain about the service there. Bryson's meet seemed to be a bit of a disaster really all round. They actually saw a drop in their numbers of buyers. That seems fairly sure that this was related to other problems outside of the company, rather than their marketing. There was a scare about meat during the period we are studying, and that meant that people bought less. So it may not actually be the company's fault. Mojo's music shop, which sells CDs and DVDs, did pretty well. Their sales have been continuously increasing, and this is very good as they are in a very difficult market. A lot of people aren't buying music from shops anymore as they download it instead. So to keep going in that situation shows that they had a very successful marketing campaign. They will have to work hard on this though, due to the number of websites online providing the same service. Well, from listening to what you've told me, it seems like you have a fairly good understanding. For the assignment, you also have to say what you think will happen in the future. Let's choose Mojo's Music Shop. What about you, Sarah? The company was established many years ago, and I'm fairly confident that this company can continue to be successful. As I said, they have shown that they have survived in a very competitive market. They had a very strong advertising campaign, and they seem very good at knowing where the market is going and how to change. What about you, John? Well, I'm not so sure, actually. There are just so few music shops that manage to survive these days. I do agree that they have been very innovative, but too many people want to buy things online, as it is so much easier and usually cheaper. Most young people don't even have DVD players these days and just listen to things on their phones. So I think eventually they will cease operating like most others. That's two very different opinions. It's been said that they have a very good management team, but I'm not sure I agree with that, as they're a bit inexperienced. I would disagree with you, Sarah, and say actually that their advertising campaign, although good, needs to be improved and more original in order to keep sales high. As John says, it's such a competitive market, they need to do everything they can. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about the history of Indian railways. First, you now have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the history of Indian railways, from when they began up until 1945, when they had all been taken over by the government. Indian Railways is an Indian state-owned enterprise, owned and operated by the Government of India through the Ministry of Railways. It is one of the world's largest railway networks, comprising 115,000 kilometers of track, over a route of 65,000 kilometers, and there are 7,500 stations. It transports over 25 million passengers daily, which is over 9 billion on an annual basis. 
Indian Railways is the world's ninth largest commercial or utility employer by number of employees, with over 1.4 million employees. The history of rail transport in India began in the mid-19th century. The core of the pressure for building railways in India came from London. In 1848, there was not a single kilometer of railway line in India. A British engineer, Robert Maitland Brereton, was responsible for the expansion of the railways from 1857 onwards. The Allahabad Jabalpur branch line of the East Indian Railway had been opened in June 1867. Brereton was responsible for linking this with the Great Indian Peninsula Railway, resulting in a combined network of 6,400 kilometers. Hence, it became possible to travel directly from Bombay to Calcutta. This route was officially opened on the 7th of March in 1870, and it was part of the inspiration for French writer Jules Verne's book, Around the World in 80 Days. At the opening ceremony, the Viceroy Lord Mayo concluded that if possible, at the earliest possible moment, the whole country should be covered with a network of lines in a uniform system. By 1875, about 95 million pounds were invested by British companies in Indian railways. By 1880, the network had a route mileage of about 14,500 kilometers, mostly radiating inwards from the three major port cities of Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. By 1895, India had started building its own locomotives, and in 1896 sent engineers and locomotives to help build the Uganda Railways. In 1900, the Great Indian Peninsula Railway became a government-owned company. The network spread to the modern-day states of Assam, Rajasthan, and Andhra Pradesh, and soon, various autonomous kingdoms began to have their own rail systems. In 1905, an early railway board was constituted, but the powers were formally vested under Lord Curzon, the then Viceroy of India. It served under the Department of Commerce and Industry, and had a government railway official serving as chairman, a railway manager from England, and an agent of one of the company railways as the other two members. For the first time in its history, the railways began to make a profit. In 1907, almost all the rail companies were taken over by the government. The following year, the first electric locomotive made its appearance, and with the arrival of World War I, the railways were used to meet the needs of the British outside India, but with the end of the war, the railways were in a state of disrepair and collapse. In 1920, with the network having expanded to 61,220 kilometers, a need for central management was mooted by Sir William Ackworth, a British railway economist. Based on the East India Railway Committee chaired by Ackworth, the government took over the management of the railways and detached the finances of the railways from the other government revenues. The period between 1920 and 1929 was a period of economic boom. There were 66,000 kilometer of railway lines serving the country. The railways represented a capital value of some 687 million sterling, and they carried over 620 million passengers and approximately 90 million tons of goods each year. Following the Great Depression, the railways suffered economically for the next eight years, and the Second World War severely crippled the railways. Starting in 1939, about 40% of the rolling stock, including locomotives and coaches, was taken to the Middle East. The railway workshops were converted to ammunitions workshops, and many railway tracks were dismantled to help the Allies in the war. By 1946, all rail systems had been taken over by the government. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Hope this helped you. 
प्लीज लाइक शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब डोंट फॉरगेट टू हिट द बेल आइकन